Yeah, that's not annoying. Yeah, that is annoying. Who didn't stable that corner? Who put it up? Our real first task of the day is to insulate, which I hate doing. I'm already getting <laughs> Why I'm itchy you already. It? Behind this tub is gonna be impossible to get to later when the insulators come, so we gotta do this ourselves. We're using an R15 high density. After we put the insulation bats in the wall, we have to cover this with like a Tyvek just to retain the insulation in the wall because the tub, you can see has a flange that makes this back surface go in away from the wall about an inch and a half. So we don't want that insulation falling out later and that's the reason for that. Yo, Jason. You gonna do this insulation or what? <laughs> Where'd everybody go? You may have noticed we put the craft paper side of the insulation facing in the room, as in inside the heat of space. Now, in this area, that's the way that it is done. If it has craft paper. In North Carolina. With all the shenanigans about vapor barriers, here's one thing I do know. We do not want moisture trapped in between the siding outside of the house and the inside of the house where the drywall is. If moisture is trapped in that area, it can mold and actually rot. Yes. So that's what everybody is trying to prevent. There's this thing like the condensation point and all this, but that's the bottom line. <laughs> Man, this Jason thing is, is like going nuts on the craft paper thing. It will stop the transmission of the vapor traveling through the wall, but I don't think he believes in the craft paper any more than I believe in Bigfoot, but don't tell Ray <laughs> that. I think he might get offended. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, aren't there professionals that do this stuff? <laughs> yeah, it's us. Why are we doing it? We're here. I see what you're doing here with the positive alignment. You like that? I'm just wondering about the holes you just put in the roof. It's in the overhang. <laughs> it's gonna be in the way of the shingles, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now up. I'm. You. You're up. Am I up? Really, what we're trying to achieve is getting the outside corner of this to be flush with the surface plane of the roof deck. And you can see that's accomplished very easily. And I don't have to fiddle up and down with it. Shoot it. All right. This is one of the trickiest kind of points where things are running together within the whole house, I think. Yeah, there's kind of no textbook for this. Um, it's a point to point thing. Yeah. Oh, are you gonna really be able to do that? No. Oh, it's it's beveled. <laughs> oh, you got it. It's a little long. I'm gonna have to bebop it around a little bit, but I did it. It's not exactly right there. I'll slide away. You slide to me. <laughs> okay, whoa. Whoa, 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 you stay right there. I'm gonna gap. Little gap. That's what, what we're looking. What's going on? That's what we're looking for. I think I think Jason needs to come down now, okay. the hill a little more. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah come yeah, on down. Okay, the you come to me. Come to me. Whoa hey oh. Okay, whoa. Okay, he's gonna mark that piece. Okay. Okay, now that point was very difficult to locate. It was. I'm gonna show you, pull it away. Look at where the point of the outside of the fascia is cut. Yeah. It's far back from there. So you would think like where I drew that line that that's where it'd be. But it's not, it's the other it's line. It's not. Point out the joint in the fascia board. Which and, line is it? Okay, this is, what do you mean? Oh, the fascia, yeah. 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 That it, that's so, it right there. So it's not at all where the corner of the subfascia is. No, it's deceiving, it's trying to trick you. And actually, if you look underneath, you probably can't because you're up there, but the underside of the hip actually runs out closer, right closer to here, but actually past. It's like out here. Yeah, so that's a good way is just two scraps and stand right behind your buddy. I, I know, you're making me really <laughs> nervous right, right behind now. your buddy while you're videoing. You're making me really nervous Really the right key. Now. I like you all, but you're way too close to me. <laughs> now all that right. they have that point mark, Jamie's gonna hold the scrap back in position. They're gonna mark short point on the top to long point on the bottom, get the length and everything one shot, hopefully. Yeah. So and the angles. That should be 25 degrees, but we need a verification on that. That was, you changed it. Yeah. The other side. They got all right, this is it. I can feel it. All right, we're doing take number. Not gonna tell you what number take this is. That that's, looks. That's pretty much. Okay, it. we're gonna call it. We're gonna call it. Good. Shoot it! Oh, I got the gun. Shoot it! Blobby Globbington there. Yeah. 
We checked it and it dries looking really nice. It does dry and, nice. and no extra uh, shine or what do you call that? Flash. No, flash. no extra flash. No flash cord. So that no works good. Cord. So this is a one by eight piece of material here and that looks nice and beefy. The upper ones are gonna be about a one by 10. And I really like the look of the LP Smart side with the matching grain that matches the siding versus some other pre-painted options like aluminum or even doing a vinyl. It just doesn't have that same beefy, rustic look. So that's why we started using these. And I really love the way it looks. I wish my house had that on it. That's an easy fix, bub. It is an easy. No, it's not easy after you got gutters and everything, but it's possible. It's possible. What are you doing next week? We have used a lot of pre-painted aluminum soffit and fascia material in the past. Because it's, it's low maintenance. It is low maintenance. It's like you don't have to paint it. Although I will say the paint does fade over time. A little um, bit, yeah. I have it on my own house. But one thing, probably the thing I hate about it the most is that when the sun hits it, it actually expands in length and wrinkles up some. Mm. Uh, you just about can't avoid that. Did you get in a fight with the paint can? I got paint all, oh, he actually this, yeah, look at this. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Well, I cut a little gap in between the corner boards and it was back in there and I couldn't brush it or anything. So I squeezed that little paint bottle and it <laughs> filled it up. So I took a little finish nail and I swiped it all out and then it went all over. And so then I was rubbing it all over the face of the corners to spread it out. But I remember uh, my first time painting. It, it looks good fun. though. I mean, you look at it now, it looks like perfection. We're getting our sewer line put in out to the tank here. And one thing they're doing is adding a locator line that comes up at the clean out so they could hook a locator to this end of it and then use their receiver to find exactly where this drain line is all the way to the tank and, you know, not mess it up if we had to dig around here somewhere else. Pretty smart. And it's required by code. <laughs> we got to yeah. talk to you about something. What? Every time you talk to someone local, you get like a country accent way more than normal. What right? did you just say? She ain't getting no fuel. <laughs> that's that's so they can understand me better. You are talking to us. He said uh, this. Oh, I, I got to go talk to my truck guy. Yeah. <laughs> he said he ain't getting no fuel there, daddy. Listen, when you take your truck to a place that the road name is Diesel Hauler. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not like yell at somebody. But that's when Natty is out here, you also get... A Latino accent. My Latino side just comes out. <laughs> but it's not, you're not speaking Spanish. Right, no, it's like uh, Spanish-American. Um, they, they understand me Jason, better. can you impersonate what he does? <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I think. Yeah, he so does I, it too. I got, I do the he same can't thing. talk. We're about to install this double patio door here, or maybe it's a French door. I think you, it's French. I don't know why it's French. It's just two doors. What I have learned over the years, it's absolutely critical, 100% that you check the flatness of this area that the sill is gonna sit on. You can see I got my six foot level here. I actually had one little hump right there where maybe there was a high joist. And the reason that could be a problem is because when the doors swing in, it'll actually hit the threshold and it won't close. And you'll hate it forever. And it's really difficult to fix. Like uh, let's say after the flooring is in or the door is installed and everything is done, and then you find out you have a problem. That's a terrible time to try to fix it. Right now, it's a lot easier to get it right from the start. I may have a better pro tip for French doors than you just gave here with the floor thing. Mm, well, it better be good is all I can say. <laughs> so on a normal door opening, you go two inches over on the rough opening Okay. Uh, over the door size. So if you had a 36 inch door, 38 inch RO. Okay. But on a French door, I leave three inches extra. Is that because it's French? No, because it has this little mulling strip or something between the two doors, think, there's an extra width. What is that called? I think I've heard it called a teastrical. Teastrical, there it is. That's a literary term. And if you don't account for that, your door won't fit in the opening. We measured the door itself and it's about 74 and a half, which would not fit in a 74 inch rough opening. Wow, that'll make any carpenter that, cry. Yeah, that would make you real sad. So it's gonna fit and uh, I think we can start putting the flashing in. Let's do it. We're installing this aluminum pan flashing in over the subfloor. And this is just to keep water that gets a little bit in on the subfloor, potentially from rotting the subfloor ever. It won't stop a flood, but usually the water's only gonna get just a little mm. bit in before our different layers of sealant uh, that we're gonna put under the door stop it. I hope this goes in easy enough. I will say that we intentionally left a tiny gap at the end of our decking boards and didn't push them tight so that this flashing can slide in behind them. 
Hopefully. We'll see what happens. I might need some help with this. Look at that. That's good. Well, I got away with it this time. It's right here. Mm, T Astra Gull. No, does it say it on there? T Astra Gull with a G. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never guessed. I mean, I'm better at numbers than letters, but whatever. One important step for us to do a good install of a door like this is to get the sealant underneath the solid part of the threshold. So we're checking that out now. We've got the door laid flat if you want to pan down. And you can see that the part of the threshold that has solid backing is only about the inside two thirds of it. The outside third is hollow. So if we were to put any sealant on the floor under this section, it wouldn't do anything. So we're gonna hit under here and it will seal the door. And we're gonna use uh, Lexel, which is a great sealant for something like this. And one last thing, I special ordered the thickness of this jam to be custom. It's five and a 16th. And that's about a half inch deeper than a normal jam because we have a half inch of rigid insulation on the inside of our sheathing here and we want the door to stick in the half inch for the drywall to be right. I can't believe you actually thought that far ahead and got that right. I mean, who doesn't love extending the jam by, you know, a half an inch later? You know, it seems like we do That's that. the problem is you love doing it and I don't. No, 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 don't get me wrong. I don't love doing it, but you know, after you do it so many times. You get good at it. You just get used to it, I guess. But I don't have to do it here, I'm happy, thank you. One more quick pro tip, they almost always sneak some screws through the top of the uh, jam into the top of the door for shipping, and they are so hard to get out. I'm laughing because when... <laughs> I installed so many and then didn't take that screw out and then had yeah. to take the whole door out. You know, it's bad because you think things are going so great and you got the door in and that was the hard part. And then <laughs> cut screws, not easy. You might think I'm going crazy putting this much sealant under here, but I'm not. This is not a place you wanna skimp on the amount of sealant that you put under here. You wanna really make sure it seals and squeezes out a little bit to know that you fully have it covered. And I wouldn't skimp on buying cheap sealant either. We use Lexel, which I think is the best stuff you can buy. And it's more expensive, but uh, you know. Well, it's cheaper you know, than replacing your subfloor that's underneath your floor. <laughs> it's pretty expensive to remove a door and fix everything. We're probably gonna remove this brick mold later, but right now we're just fastening it and it's pulling the door all the way tight to the wall and also squaring it up and plumbing it for us. And then we'll shim and fasten through the door jam. Jason and I are in the attic. How's it feel up here? Um, great. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> grand, wonderful. Yeah. We're adding an access that's gonna come out of this closet because there's gonna be a air handler for the heat unit. There's the wiring and duct work that's gonna service this upstairs area. And right now, this isn't wide enough for that air handler to come through. It's, she's a big boy. So Vegan. we're gonna head her off this one ceiling joist and make this a big wide opening for future access. This is a good tip here. We're gonna hack this, but we've already done a temporary support across to the next two ceiling joists. So when we cut this, it doesn't just fall out of there. You wanna cut it? Um, uh, yeah, one thing also I was gonna say is that when he did that measurement, he also took into consideration uh, extra, uh, well, well like the, the header boards. Bigger, yeah, the header yeah. board to make sure that the opening was what he wanted. Not to so we're gonna cut it 33, the finish will be 30 even. Yeah, that one. Just as a side note here, building a house that has an attic and a crawl space makes it so much easier for your heat and air to have somewhere to be installed versus a house that has a vaulted ceiling and or a slab. Sometimes there's just nowhere to put the ductwork where it's not exposed.
You know what's crazy that I just found out? What? There's a Perkins Brothers Builders in Snell Beach. And we're Perkins Builder Brothers, but I just got a bunch of their emails and just figured out that someone else has the exact same name, just flip the words. Oh. And man. they're builders. Were they good emails? Yeah, it was like people accepting the quote. Oh, that they proposed. Not like so whoever's money. getting that garage door replaced or repaired, <laughs> I hope they got your email. <laughs> Jamie and I are walking through the house to check out some of the subcontractors work, like the heat and air and the plumbing, and everything's looking great. And we were talking about it, and I think that the reason that it always turns out great is the companies that we tend to hire for subcontractors, the owner is part of the crew. They're in on the action. And so they're really vested in making sure that a really nice job is done. So if you're getting into contracting, I would say that's a good tip to hire subcontractors where the owner is easily contacted by a cell phone. He's on the job. He knows what's going on. And I think there's a lot better chance in getting a good finished product in that way. It may be harder to get the owner of a company on the job site when you're using a large company, like a huge company. Now, there are advantages to using bigger companies, but it's really frustrating if you call the home office and you can't even speak to the person that knows anything about your job site. That is frustrating. You're like at a standstill. If you're like on the job about to do something, you got a question, you didn't answer, you can't get a hold of the person because they are running 15 or 20 different jobs, then... It, it, you might be stuck for a while until you get a, you get an answer. Uh, What's the deal? Answer. Well, we're about tapped out here. We didn't bring enough material. Hey, by the way, we didn't bring all of this material here because it would have taken up the whole parking area. So it's at a remote location. We're bringing a little bit every day. As needed. We have not enough room. I got to walk a half mile just to get to my truck. <laughs> and uh, I'm tired of that. So actually, you know, if we actually got the grading finished out here, we would have some room to park. Thanks for checking out our video today. I hope you enjoyed it. And just a reminder for those of you that are builders, designers, remodelers, check out the House Pro software that we've been using. It has a great client dashboard that our clients love so they can keep up with our project even though they're not local. It also has an easy to use mobile app, which is great because I'm hardly ever in the office. And it's saving us a ton of time when giving quotes, pricing, and just dealing with clients and leads. There's a link in our description. You can try it out for free. Thanks for watching our video today and we will see you on the next one.